to, I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and I want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. Those are both crucial to our success. And I am thrilled today to welcome William Nixon uh, from the University of Glasgow. Our executive director, Rachel Frick, attended a presentation given by William at a recent conference and suggested that he would be an outstanding addition to our schedule. I look forward to his wisdom on sustaining and delivering open at the University of Glasgow, and I'll take just a second here, to pass uh, the presenter baton to William. Uh, William, you can go ahead and unmute and take it away. Thank you so much, Marilee, and uh, thank you, Rachel. That's um, no, no pressure at all then in delivering this session to colleagues. Um, thank you very much again for the opportunity. Um, some of this will be to reprise the session which I did in um, at Open Repositories in Bozeman, Montana earlier this year, but I think it's really great to have this opportunity to share our experience about delivering and sustaining open at the University of Glasgow. And I'm going to do that through the journey of our Enlightened Institutional Repository Service. Um, and I'd also like to thank colleagues um, who have taken the time to join today's webinar. So what I'm going to talk about is sustaining and delivering um, open and how that has been integral and an integral part of the DNA since the inception of our repository work back in 2001-2002. Um, I'm going to draw in four broad themes, uh, technology and metadata, staffing, culture, and policy. And I'm going to use these to demonstrate how they have underpinned our commitment to open and also to sustainability. And I hope I can provide some lessons drawn from our past experience to look ahead to our exciting future as we continue to support open through the delivery of new services and new repositories. Um, I think we're also going to focus on a number of critical factors which enabled us to embed, and I'm going to come back to that, that phrase, embed Enlighten as a key university service to ensure its sustainability. So um, we'll continue to highlight those as well as new services and how we've added things from the early days of publications and theses to supporting research data and now open education resources. Um, I firmly believe that the future is open and I hope that this presentation today will show that in order to sustain open that we have worked to ensure this network is aligned with our institutional strategy and provides value and support for both the university and the broader public good. So, uh, a couple of things. Who am I? This is from my Twitter, uh, and I bill myself apparently as a repository pragmatist. Um, I am a passionate supporter and believer in open repositories and open access. Um, I've been very fortunate to be a member of the Open Repositories Steering uh, Committee and to attend a number of the Open Repositories conferences. If colleagues um, on the call haven't attended those, I highly recommend if you've got any interest in repositories and open, uh, really check those out. They are, a, it's a fabulous community and a really uh, great opportunity to uh, get up to speed with work which is going on currently in the, in the repositories and the open space. Um, more recently, I've become a member of the Confederation of Open Access Repositories, COAR, and I'm going to come back to a little bit about COAR at the end of the presentation since they've done a really interesting piece of work around next generation repositories, which I think signals again another step change in looking at how we can further develop and sustain our repositories. Um, I would say I'm an evolutionary, not a revolutionary, which is why um, I bill myself as a, um, a pragmatist. We have at times probably not moved super fast with our repository, but we have been steady and I think as an echo to the, this, this webinar series, we are definitely a work in progress. Um, so we also need to look at how we manage our own and our other expectations. Now that doesn't mean that we can't be bold in pitching the direction and the vision and where we want to go with open and with our repositories, but I think it's really important that we bring um, our colleagues with us. So um, clearly you've all joined today's 
uh, webinar talk because I'm sure you also want to support, enable, and accelerate that move to open within your own institutions and your, your bodies. And I look forward uh, to some of our chat. So where have I come from? This is the University of Glasgow. We were established in 1451. So this year we are celebrating our 567th anniversary. And our university strategic plan sets out our ambition to build on our current success, to continue to be a world-class, world-changing university. Research is incredibly important uh, to this university. As you can see from this slide, 81% um, of our research is judged internationally excellent. And I'll come back to, to research and an exercise in the United Kingdom called the Research Excellence Framework uh, later in today's presentation. We're also ranked fourth in what's called the Russell Group um, for teaching. The Russell Group um, is the, universe, the, uh, the research groups, uh, research universities within the United Kingdom. And there are 20 four of us who are very clearly working towards delivering that research for the United Kingdom. So um, in 2002, we piloted our first open access repository using the ePrints software. And today, um, what I would like to refer to as an integrated network of these repositories, which help us to realize that, and what I'm going to share with you today. So what you can see in this next slide, is this is a little bit of history of the university. These are our cloisters. Um, in 2017, we were named Scottish University of the Year. And, but beyond that, you know, we can look back. We have um, as a number of um, our graduates, um, people like Adam Smith, who published The Wealth of Nations. And that is really important. That's part of the Scottish Enlightenment. One of the reasons why we've branded our repository service as Enlighten. And this is repository heresy, but actually we don't find the word repository a helpful term. We actually find that having branded it and badged it as a service uh, called Enlighten has incredibly, uh, has become incredibly valuable for those discussions and that communication with academic colleagues. So this is the spoiler slide. So I'm hoping no one is going to leave the presentation uh, yet. But essentially, this is what I'm going to come back to. This is our repository sitting as a nexus at the heart of supporting and sustaining open at the university and plugged into lots of other university systems, um, plugged into um, a landscape supporting research, supporting funders, um, and so on. So what I want to do today is I'm going to come back to this, but I want and I'm going to work backwards to how we got here. Um, but we are very proud of the work that we have done to develop and sustain this uh, embedded and sustainable repository service. And I think the important thing about that is here we have, I've been talking there about enlighten, but actually the key word here of all these words is not enlighten or repository, it's service. And service is absolutely critical for us. Um, that's really bringing together both the tin, the technology, and the people, the staff, the people who are our advocates, the people who support and help us to actually deliver our institutional repository service. And actually, they are at the very heart um, of that service. The platform is great. The platform is potentially a, a, movable, uh, a movable feast, a movable uh, you know, technology option. But the culture, uh, the policy, the, the staff, which all underpin that, are absolutely critical. So what you can see here is we have a number of kind of core components to our um, enlightened service. Everything is badged under the title Enlighten, and that was a nice nod, we thought, to Caltech. Uh, um, Caltech had rolled out a suite of repositories under the CODA banner. So each of the individual repositories did different things. And um, we, really, uh, we really liked that idea. Um, and over time, we have, rather than create one super repository. We have built a number of very um, 
very bespoke repositories for specific content types. So that includes publications. So that is um, open access publications, conference proceedings, journal articles, and so on. Um, we moved on to theses. So we capture all the, the theses. We capture these digitally now um, as they are submitted by graduates. Um, we are currently doing some work to backfill the theses repository. We have 13,000 hard copy theses, which we are doing a major scanning uh, and invested in a major scanning and digitization project. And we're going to be making these available to the wider community as well. Um, interestingly, we find people are very interested in downloads and access um, to theses. And we also have uh, research data driven um, as much by needs of our academics as by funding councils in the United Kingdom. We are looking at ways in which we need to host or at least provide pointers towards the research data which underpins our publications held at the university. And we do that in a number of different ways. We don't host all of the data in the research data repository. Um, in many cases, it actually just points to uh, it, it can point to where that data is held. Um, we, have in our, we have a subscription with the British Library, so we mint DOIs, we use their data site service. So we print human readable, machine readable, uh, digital object identifiers, and those object identifiers can be cited um, if we get the research data soon enough in the publications for our academic colleagues, but they also provide opportunities for us to link the publications and the research data together. So although these are, are sitting as separate repositories, they are part of a broader uh, part of a broader whole um, and kind of part of the, the value proposition, the services which we provide to the university. So I think one comment to make is it, when we went back and we were having a look at uh, working with colleagues, looking at setting up this presentation. Um, we've been doing this quite a long time. Um, so it's a bit like the jobbing actor who has become um, an overnight success. But what you don't see is the many years of graft and hard work before they suddenly, you know, you know, you know, turn up into a, a major, you know, a major motion picture or, um, you know, a big primetime TV show. Sometimes we've perhaps been a little bit of a slow burn, but that I think has been a boon for us. It has helped us really look at how we have built in sustainability from the outset. So looking from left to right here, from 2002 to 2005, um, we had some external funding where we seconded staff internally. We've always made sure that we can look at making sure that we capture the in particular in the early days of, of open and repositories, those skills as we, we got to know what they were, so that once the project finished and we had to ensure that we had additional, we had local funding, we were able to support that funding and take that forward. Enlighten was launched in 2006. Um, so that is now 12 years, 12 years old. And during this time as well, you know, really we have seen a lot of political, technical, and cultural change, which I'll kind of you know, touch on. But what we have found is in 2008, we do have a university publications policy to make the university, the repository become the focus for all of the university's publications. And that was a really critical um, development for us so that we extended beyond just our open access remit, which has enabled us to really build up on that. In 2010, um, 2010 was a real sea change. In 2010, we really started being able to tie our outputs to individual staff, but also to funding bodies. So we were really, at that point on our journey, very clearly showing the value of connecting all of this together. I think there's a university um, there, there, there's a commitment to, uh, for us within the university as well of a, a curation and a stewardship of the research and the research outputs which we provide, which the Enlightened Repository Service, the Enlightened Network can fulfill and can provide. Um, and as I said earlier, in 2016, we moved on to a data repository 
We have got a new open education repository this year, and um, I've just put 2021 there. That is when the Research Excellence Framework um, will be reporting, which is a, a national um, assessment exercise. And in between all of that, um, we've had the opportunity to work very closely with colleagues in Spark, um, you know, looking at things um, and, and work such as Open Access Week, ensuring that we can look at how we can set that default to open, um, contributing to or, or becoming members of bodies like um, COAR for the Confederation of Open Access Repositories. The work that the European Union do, has done in supporting and promoting open science um, the changes within our funding councils, um, the UK uh, Research and Innovation Office, and the funders' requirements driving us more and more towards sustainability and open for publications and for the, the content which we have. So I said today I was going to touch on sort of four themes, and here they are presented um, with sustainability at the core. So you have staffing, culture, policy, and technology. And I think it's really important that what you see with these, these four is you really can't take them in isolation. And as, as I've said already, that the, the technology is very important, but the technology on its own just gives you a very shiny box, which might not possibly not do very much. Um, you really do need the staffing, the cultural change, but also looking at how you can engage with the, the policy and so on as well, so that you have these drivers that provide us with the synergy for sustainability and for open. So in this next uh, slide, what we can look at here, this is a sort of snapshot of a number of the staff and the skills who support OPEN and our repositories here at Glasgow. So this will give you a sense of um, who we actually have involved doing all of that and some of the work which they do. Um, some of this ranges from at the, the open access end of the spectrum um, in dealing with um, individual publishers, processing invoices, dealing with publishing deals equally as well about helping spread the message, the advocacy, making sure that we can work with champions who are our senior academics, working to make sure that we can contribute and engage with uh, research, uh, uh, research committees within the university, and also looking at dealing with policies and issue resolution as well, um, dealing with um, you know, challenges with publishers, um, policies, funder um, embargoes, um, particular guidelines and rules around how particular funding can be spent, do things need um, particular exemptions from open access, what formats do things need to be in, how do we manage um, author processing charges and so on. So we can see as well we have <laughs> a research information manager, we have a team who manage uh, uh, you know, the open access uh, triage, we call it the triage. Um, I think it's very clear as well at this point to say that although we initially set out to be self-deposit, by and large the library, the, the university library here at Glasgow mediates and manages the um, open access and publications for colleagues. We have a repository team who deal with the metadata and the work around that. We have a finance team and we have some technical support. That technical support as you know, just over half a person um, only reflects the technical support that we have in the, um, in the library here. So these are the teams just within the library, but actually um, we, these roles are all complemented both by developers and IT staff who we work in partnership with in our IT services team who make sure that the servers are backed up um, and running and so on, but also with our research office, with our web teams and so on. And when we come to look at the, um, the, the, the staff profiles page, much of that has been done in collaboration, working hand in glove uh, with other parts of the university and being able to 
to um, have those discussions around how we can add value. And adding value has been a, a recurring theme around what we want to do to ensure our sustainability and our open at Glasgow. So in talking a little bit about this, the second theme, that is really sort of policy. And we've been fortunate to have a range of, of policies, um, both at local, national uh, level, which have really driven um, our increase in our engagement around um, open access. So back in 2008, so this year it's 10th anniversary, we had a, a, an initial publications policy and that was about increasing the visibility of our research and as I've indicated already, ensuring that research outputs are prepared and curated so we, man we can manage that, but also that that will help how the university presents itself to, um, in the UK, these national assessment exercises uh, which drive that um, and which are aligned here with you know, the university's ambition in its, uh, at the time, sort of building on excellence and to continue to be uh, world changing. But at a national level, and this is, I realize, very, uh, a very kind of, in some cases, very UK situation, um, but we do have um, every five or six years what is called the Research Excellence Framework now, and this is a national exercise which essentially assesses the research quality of all of the universities here in the United Kingdom. And that's very important uh, because it also um, is a gateway to additional funding which the university receives um, every year in order for us to support research. So the funding that we get um, from funding bodies for particular work is one funding stream. However, through the Research Excellence Framework, we also get um, additional funding which enables us to take on board other pieces of research, other, other elements to explore. And I think a really big change around this for the next Research Excellence Framework has been an open access policy which came into force on the 1st of April in 2016. So this is really at that national level in the UK and here at an institutional level, um, been a real sea change around how we engage um, and look at that driver to make as much um, of our content as open access as possible. Indeed, it looks like with the most recent guidelines for the REF, um, you'll only ever be allowed, uh, unless you have content for which you can provide an exemption for why it's a specific reason why it could not be open access, only 5% of our content um, can't be open access in order to provide that. So at the moment, our compliance rate for open access is sitting at around 83%, and the University Library here provides a full service to support all of that open. So we have a team that will work with our academic colleagues, and all we ask, we try to make this as frictionless as possible, all we ask is that our colleagues, to begin that discussion, notify the library when a publication is accepted. So some of this has very much changed the dynamic around when we are notified and deal with content, particularly publications in the Enlightened Repository Service, it's now at the, the point of acceptance, not at a point where things are already in press or things have already been published. Um, more nationally as well, <clears throat> colleagues um, across the university, uh, across the, the UK and also with funding from um, the Research Libraries UK have been continuing to explore um, a UK scholarly communications license. So this would be like the Harvard uh, model, but would be applied um, or could be taken up by uh, universities across um, the United Kingdom. So there's work being done around this just now and a number of universities are looking at being early adopters and um, led by Chris Banks um, here in the UK, 
the there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of engagement with publishers around that and some of the, the challenges and um, robust exchanges around that as we look um, to how that can be taken forward to really help our researchers retain the reuse rights in their own work and make more of that content open. So I've already talked a little bit about um, open access and funders and the, the REF. Um, the open access requirements for the REF are focused specifically on journal articles and conference proceedings, and they are required to be open access within 12 months for science, technology, and engineering and medicine, and 24 months for arts and humanities. And they need to have been deposited within Enlighten or their subject repository um, within three months of their acceptance. So as you can see, that's really critical for us having that, um, having that engagement. You can see on the browse by year side of the, this slide, one of the really interesting consequences of this is um, this presentation here in August. So for 2018, um, we've already captured or we have details of nearly 4,500 outputs from the university. Um, looking at previous years, we are tracking 6,700, 6,800. Um, so with the move to deposit on acceptance and that much earlier engagement around open access, we're also seeing that we capture a lot of the details and a lot of the outputs for the repository much earlier in the process. So the third theme that I wanted to touch on was technology and metadata. And I think the really important thing about that is that TIN is very important, but as I say, it is not the, the be all and end all. Our core services are built on um, ePrints and we have a service contract with ePrint services, but we host our repositories locally to maximize integration. Um, and I think that integration, integration, integration element there is incredibly critical for us. So we use ePrints, uh, we support Archivum for our research data. Um, we're working to um, more tightly integrate ORCIDs into the repository. Um, the repository is um, where we're holding ORCIDs. Um, but equally, as I was saying, with the integration, then we're linked into our HR system, uh, linked into our ID management system, staff profiles, the research information system as well. Um, and all of, these, all of these integration elements have enabled us to demonstrate that value add and to look at how we can um, really combine and engage with colleagues around that. Um, we're virtualizing all of our uh, um, services as well, so moving much more to virtual machines. And that final kind of bullet point, Google Love, um, that is something that we have found really interesting, um, particularly using um, ePrints and the, the regular harvesting of Google. We see a lot of the traffic, the bulk of our traffic to our service and our repositories comes from either Google or from staff profile pages. And we find that Google is very, very quick in harvesting and also ranking the content which is held in our repository. And last but not least in terms of culture, one of the really interesting things, I think, as a result, again, coming back to the, the synergy, is <clears throat> moving to a point no longer about asking people about why the um, content needs to be open access or needs to be made open access. That's not to say that there are still not parts of the university, parts of our community that we still need to reach out to and we need to engage with, um, but very much we can see much more that um, even with the before the REF open access policy, that there has been a marked change um, starting to, to ask why, um, uh, rather to ask not why, but how. And that's where um, we have looked at how we can make that process as straightforward for our academic colleagues, how we can provide that frictionless deposit experience 
and support and sustain our open content. So I just want to revisit this uh, this slide that we started with, my, my spoiler slide, um, just to say, you can see here at the heart, the publications repository, um, and coming back from kind of Google Love, you can see there, there is the, um, you know, Google who is very regularly harvesting our content. Um, up on the, the top right, um, we have um, a Scopus um, profile. We're starting to look at um, bringing in Scopus um, identifiers as well as ORCID identifiers into the repository. We've been using the repository to support our readiness for the next, <clears throat> the next REF, REF 2021. So we've been having a look at that. Um, we use the repository to report back to funders, but we also are integrated with our funding system. So as we have publications, we link these together to the grants that they have provided so that our academics can see the publications that are actually related um, to particular grants and funding. We embed um, alt metrics, alternative metric data. Um, we're using alt metric as a platform. Um, we, <coughs> excuse me, we provide um, that for the individual records within the repository where they are matched with a DOI. And we can push a lot of those, uh, a lot of that content out into pages. So one of the, I guess, one of the fundamental principles for us with Enlighten is deposit once, give us your information once, and it is reused um, in lots of different ways. Um, it's reused, um, can be reused or pushed into ORCID. Um, it will be uh, used to provide some reporting for funders, um, also into staff profile pages, um, but also as well for providing um, the, the feed into staff's performance and review profile so that they don't have to compile a list of publications. Those publications are delivered from the repository. Um, the team know when publication, uh, when uh, performance review is ongoing um, because they uh, tend to get queries from uh, colleagues who have identified publications that may well be missing. Um, and if they're missing, they don't flow through into the staff profile pages or into the performance review without those. Um, this is the staff profile page of our Vice Principal for Research, uh, Professor Miles Padgett. Um, and what I just wanted to draw attention to here is the, the grey boxes. Um, so we have research interests. Um, which is a free text field which um, has details of Miles' research, but the other three boxes are drawn from the repository services. We have selected publications, research data, and all publications. So in the last couple of years, um, staff um, profiles only display publications which are held in the repository. Um, so we moved to that in collaboration, working with our web team, but the single biggest um, piece of feedback we got around that was staff wanted to actually highlight their individual, you know, a, a sort of uh, a number of individual publications and not just um, present um, you know, their, their colleagues, their peers, their, their students with the full list of their publications. So we have a, an option now called selected publications. Um, also on the screen now, you can see there's the ORCID. Um, ORCIDs, which are now being added to the repository, are now being pushed out into staff profile pages um, automatically. So there is about 900 of those uh, which we've now been uh, pushing out and they've been switched on and are made available uh, for our staff to work with. Um, and more recently, um, we've looked at how we can package much of the information um, together. So as I said, we were, um, question is less now about why, um, but about how. And we've really been looking at a new managing publications um, and supporting open um, website where we're uh, suggesting to our colleagues three simple steps. Um, register, which is focused around ORCID, sharing your outputs 
through um, the institutional repositories, through subject repositories, and tracking and managing those outputs through tools like um, Scopus and Altmetric and so on as well. So this is how we've been looking at um, bundling that together and providing that, um, that information to support um, our colleagues in taking that forward. Um, and I think we will, this is a, a webinar series on works in progress. We are definitely a work in progress. Uh, a repository uh, doesn't currently do digital preservation. We've recently um, enacted a digital preservation policy at the university. We are doing some work on piloting some different tools, some different platforms which can support that. And we're really interested in looking at ways in which we can link together the repositories, in particular, um, the thesis repositories. Um, I think in the UK, it's very common we still take at least one hard copy version of a thesis as well as an e-version um, of a thesis. We haven't moved to a model yet where we have e-only. Um, and I think um, here on the other side of this slide, um, the next generation repositories work, which was done by the uh, Confederation of Open Access Repositories, a, a working group there, looking at ways in which we can really kind of further develop and think ahead to what we are going to do with those. And this featured quite a lot in the Open Repositories Conference back in, uh, back in June this year. And it's really interesting to see different platforms, whether it's DSpace or ePrints or, or so on, look at how they can get um, involved and engaged with this space. So I just wanted to, to finish with some, some takeaways that we found from our experience here at Glasgow on sustaining and delivering open. Um, the, the first one is actually just to commit to open. That is something um, which we have done through, through our engagement with our institutional repositories, through the national and the local policies which we've done, the setup of our repositories, um, looking at how we can engender that open culture within the university. Have that clarity of vision and scope around what does open look like for the university? Where does that align with the, the strategy? Um, having that high level institutional report is critical. We have been very fortunate um, with that um, support from our vice principal for research and so on. Um, open and open source is fantastic. It's also really important, however, to invest in the staff as well as the tin and the technology. Um, it's the staff that really, I think, are the heart of our repository service um, that will help see us really do that value add and deliver that um, open. And then I've, I've talked a lot about value during today's presentation. And really, I would say, yes, add value. And then when you think of added value, add some more. Continue to look for ways in which you can do that. And we've started doing that now, um, bringing in um, other identifiers into uh, the repository, looking at ways in which we can reach out and engage with other parts of the university systems. Um, we are now working with our postgraduate researchers. Um, postgraduate researchers can now also um, become part of the Enlightened Service. It's, it's, it's good to have them um, be seen as co-authors or authors in their own right and given parity with our research staff. Um, don't be an island. I think a siloed repository is not going to do anything and not really support or sustain open. Having those connections, both technical and um, with relationships with other parts of the university and the system is incredibly crucial. And support not just the current generation, the current researchers that we have, but be mindful of those next generation of researchers. So thinking about for us, um, how we can move to e-only deposit completely with our theses, bringing those, um, that next generation of researchers, you know, with us around that, making sure that um, they can look at ways in which they can um, make their research data open and, and so on as well. So. Those were just a, a number of the kind of key takeaways. 
and a way to sort of take things forward. So that is the end of the, the slide deck which I had today. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, colleagues in both the Enlighten and our research information management teams here at the University of Glasgow for all their support and assistance in putting this together. And thank you very much for your, your time this afternoon. That's great, William. Thank you so much for your uh, remarks and um, also for sharing uh, the lovely views of your city along the way. I found those to be uh, just very um, uh, warm and inspiring, uh, as well as, of course, hearing, hearing your voice. Um, so we do have uh, a number of questions from our audience who've been engaged in chat while you've been uh, speaking. So uh, I'll just go ahead and go through the questions in order. And if other people have questions, we'll probably have uh, time to answer a few more apart from the ones that are listed here. So warm your fingers up in that chat box and send to all participants. Um, so the first question is from Kyle Brady from uh, St. Andrews University. And uh, Kyle says, it would be great to hear more about what you're doing to promote open access for environment statements. Okay, hi Kyle. Um, so that is probably for our colleagues from Pittsburgh and Minnesota, um, a fairly kind of potentially UK centric question. So the research excellence framework is made up of a number of different elements. One of those is called environment and environment is about um, providing the, the sort of the research environment and part of that um, we, we institutions are encouraged to report around how they are committed to and reporting um, uh, on open um, and so the, 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 the framework the tools and so on that we have around supporting open access to uh, support the policy for uh, for HEFKE so I think for um, for us, for environment, uh, it's really about that engagement with our academics when we accept when we accept their paper, when we accept their papers. Um, we do a lot of engagement at the. We have four individual colleges here at the University of Glasgow, so it's about where we can engage with those colleges. We are also very fortunate in that we work very closely with the head of policy and strategy within the university and we are very clear that we align anything that we are doing around open and around support for this excellent research excellence framework uh, with that um, to, the, to those bodies uh, to look at how we can do that. The library is seen as the, the um, I would say the center of, of excellence and advice around open for the university and we will continue to engage and work with the individual uh, subject areas with that to support environment statements. Great. I'm going to stop there, that's a very... Okay, beautiful. okay, we'll, we'll let that sink in. Um, okay, Stephen Hearn from University of Minnesota has a pair of questions. The first is, have, uh, has your institution had any problems getting researchers to label and explain research data to increase the possibilities for downstream use? This is sometimes seen by scholars as an added and unnecessary burden. So, uh, in, well, interestingly enough, we were just talking about this um, earlier on uh, in, the, um, in the week we, uh, I don't think that we do. In many cases, a lot of uh, th there are some mandates from funders now that require uh, research data to be deposited, whether it is in our own institutional repository um, or elsewhere. And we have we we can provide support with our individual academics, um, both at the point at which they are submitting. Um, they are submitting their proposal um, and using tools like the Digital Curation Center's um, DMP online tool to support um, that, that, uh, that bid, but also um, at the other end of the scale, 
uh, working with them to provide readme statements that um, essentially help to unpack here is all the data that is in this zip file and that is in um, that that the data is here and how it could actually be used um, so I think that's something that we find we have a the colleagues in our research information management team work closely with our academics to to do that so that that's been fairly collaborative and useful great um, another question from Stephen is there a way to claim peer-reviewed status for research contributed directly to enlightening so um, the answer so the answer to that I think is no so enlighten uh, reflects um, content which is already um, peer-reviewed so we don't use it as a platform for applying any kind of peer review we do have a flag to indicate whether content is or isn't um, peer-reviewed but that would be as a result of it having gone through um, peer review from whichever journal that it was being um, submitted with so in many cases content such as um, um, some conference papers and so on um, will be flagged just as not peer review but we don't um, we don't use this as a platform for peer review okay um, or for reflecting uh, peer, peer review so the searching by that for example uh, there um, yes there is uh, there, there's an option in the advanced search to limit by you know show me just the content which is peer-reviewed for instance yes there is there's an option to do that but we don't okay. apply any peer review to it right I see uh, Stephen is a, a uh, one of our um, very engaged uh, metadata people so I think he's he, he may be coming at it from from that from that angle um, Aaron Brenner asks how do you frame your institutional repositories with respect to other external repository options uh, for example disciplinary repositories and is the university's publications policy a big driver of local use um, and or the deposit the deposit support provided by the library's repository team so a number of kind of uh, embedded and sub questions there okay so that's I've I've got his question up so um, in terms of other institutional repositories so we could think here as an example of archive or repec um, they are they are all great however we are also very clear that our um, open access policy requires you to uh, um, provide um, notification of when it's actually when the paper has been accepted and to provide us with a copy of that which will be um, unless there's there is an exemption uh, a copy of that to be held in our institutional repository now for things like archive we will then link out to the version um, also which can be in archive but um, we also at the point of acceptance um, we uh, we are capturing that so um, a thousand flowers bloom where that there's where we are not um, stopping any academic or we, we certainly would never do that we are not stopping academic colleagues from working with um, already established systems such as repec for econ uh, for economists and so on but we need to have um, at the very least details of that output and ideally that um, full text output in our repository Okay. now there was I'm just going to go back to that so um, is the university publication policy a big driver of local use um, I think it is less less so now it's been overtaken um, in recent years by things like the uh, the Hefke open access uh, sorry that's the higher education funding council for the the research excellence framework um, open access policy and that is very much uh, driving that one of the things that I didn't say in the, the main body of the presentation is that 
Um, with that compliance rate, we also regularly provide uh, at the moment reports to all of our colleges. Um, so they have an indication of um, how compliant um, each of their uh, each of their colleges um, are in terms of uh, making content um, open access and highlighting anything for uh, which may need to be explored further. And your last question amongst that sub questions were um, the deposits support provided by the library. So that support, I think, is a key driver for us. We have tried to make this as frictionless as possible. There are still some schools or some individuals who like to upload and uh, who like to upload their content uh, themselves. Um, however, um, by and large, um, the staffing, so the, the Enlightened Repository team here in the staffing slide, um, they, uh, they provide that mediated deposit service. So um, they will start with that and they will shepherd that um, output through its, life, through its life cycle. So when we have it deposited initially as an accepted paper, um, for instance, it won't have a DOI or volume or number um, or so on. And that is something that we will subsequently add as it goes through the publishing life cycle. Okay, great. And I took the uh, liberty of uh, moving to that slide. You did. That was great. I thought <laughs> I pushed something. Aaron was. Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't want to startle you, uh, but but I, I thought that Aaron Aaron's question probably uh, referenced that slide. I don't see any other questions um, right at the moment, um, but I had one question myself, which is that you talked about uh, in a, in a lovely way uh, your emergence onto the stage. Um, with uh, years of invisible preparation uh, in the background, which I thought was a, a great um, analogy. And I think we can all ask, are we ready for our close-ups? Um, but uh, I, was, I was wondering uh, along that path if you had um, some wisdom to share around uh, paths that you explored that didn't turn out to be so fruitful. Um, uh, maybe maybe one example of, 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 of a way that you went that didn't uh, that didn't that didn't turn out the way that you thought it would, um, or was everything just a linear uh, progression to greatness? You know, I would love to say it was a linear. I like that linear progression to greatness. I would love to say it was a linear progression to greatness, uh, but it wasn't. As you know, we have had. Um, I think. It's a bit chicken and egg. Getting started was um, very challenging because that that and, the, and flipping that flipping my not why but how question on its head would be um, having those conversations uh, with staff about um, you know why. And I think if we go back, I think one of the things which is very very different now, if we were to do it now. Although I guess to some extent we've also been responsible for some of that transformative environment, is um, is, is the fact that um, our academic colleagues, our producers of content, our researchers, and so on, um, are getting these messages not just from library staff or research managers. It's really being it's being woven into requirements from funding councils that they are going to get funding from. I mean, if if you look at the, the early work of, you know, the, the Wellcome Trust um, in particular in championing, um, uh, in championing open and starting to, to really um, see that, uh, see that change. So I think one of the things that I think perhaps made us a bit of a slow burn was trying to convince people of of the value of this when um, it, it, they would be very, very early adopters and there wasn't much in the way of repositories and perhaps our interfaces and things were a bit clunky. Um, I think one of the things we have certainly moved away from or one of the, the lessons we learned is um, making that library commitment and that investment in the team that supports the metadata 
and the deposit side of things. Um, I think that um, was very, very valuable. I think initially, you know, there was the, the idea that this would all be brilliantly open access, uh, or, or sort of brilliantly um, self, you know, it would be self-depositing and self-perpetuating, um, and that really wasn't the case. And even, you know, I think if you were to do some UX testing, not only with our repository, but with others, people would probably be quite horrified um, by the experience of actually trying to get something deposited and in there and the right metadata added. Um, and we've, we've taken that opportunity to take that, to take that role on, which I think for us um, provides, it provides that value. And I think for the library service, it provides um, a different, a different research support um, role and value and experience, which um, is different from perhaps what our academic colleagues were more used to in a, in a kind of more traditional sense. Thank you for, uh, for, for indulging me with that. One of these days I want to have a, a webinar called My Favorite Mistake uh, and <laughs> invite people to talk about, um, well, that wasn't really a mistake. That was just, uh, uh, it gave you a lot of practice. Um, in, in honing, honing your message and, and honing your staff. So, um, Absolutely. Just what you said there. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I want to uh, thank you, William, for, for sharing your wisdom with us today and also thank our attendees. We had uh, a great uh, representation. It really uh, shows the transnational uh, nature of the partnership. So uh, thank you all for attending today and thank you for your um, engagement and great questions. And thank you all also for being uh, a part of the, the partnership for both underwriting and participating in our programs. We welcome your input on uh, things you would like to present on or things you'd like to learn more about. And we will ferret out those presenters on those topics. So um, uh, this presentation has been recorded and we will uh, shoot an email out to you just as soon as it is available on our website or you can just check back at uh, that short URL, oc.lc, WIP webinars, and uh, you will find it there. You can also sign up for um, more news on our announced newsletter. If you're not already signed up for that, send me an email. I'd be happy to add you. And uh, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you all so much. Thank you all. Cheers. Bye.